with host Sabrina Salvati. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. I have a very special guest tonight. She was the Democratic candidate who primary challenged Joe Manchin in 2018 and went on to win the Democratic primary in 2020. She's also an activist, and she was one of the first Justice Democrats. Everyone, please give a huge welcome to Paula Jean Swearingen. Hi. Thank you for having me on, Sabrina. Thanks so much for coming on. I have so much to ask you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So the first thing I'm I'm curious about, you ran a grassroots campaign twice. Mm -hmm. Um, What were some of the challenges that you faced running a grassroots campaign? Um, We actually broke records in 2018 and 2020. We were the first um, campaign in West Virginia to have a people funded campaign. And in the first 30 days, we raised over $80,000 and the average donation was around 27. In 2020, um, even though Shelly Moore Capito, she's corporate funded, um, we actually outraised her in small donations um, in the last two quarters. Um, Well, we outraised her totally in the last two quarters um, and with a small donation campaign. But the biggest challenge was the Democratic establishment. Of course, in 2018, they said they weren't going to show any biases, but the Democratic Party um, did show biases uh, with Joe Manchin. There were so many things that they did that they shouldn't have. But in 2020, I was the Democratic nominee. We'd done everything that we were supposed to do. Um, Every um, federal nominee in West Virginia, we were all women. We were all progressive. And we really didn't get hardly any support from the party. Blue, no matter who, doesn't exist. I don't care what anybody says, because um, even after the numbers came in and the votes came in, a lot of the establishment still voted for Shelley Moore Capito against me. And of course, Joe Manchin didn't come out and support. Um, But even, you know, with the Republican opposition, the hardest thing as a grassroots candidate and as a Democrat was the opposition from the Democratic Party, because we, you know, I was an ordinary person. I wasn't a polished politician. I didn't take that dark money. And so they definitely didn't support me and any candidate like myself across the country. It was the same way for them. Mm. Saul Good said a coal miner's daughter should have won. Turns out the game's rigged. I agree, Saul. Now, you were one of the first people to join Justice Democrats. I'm curious, like, what was your experience like, like when you joined Justice Democrats And how do you feel about the direction Justice Democrats is going now? Well, actually, I didn't join Justice Democrats. We were all nominated, including um, AOC, through um, brand new Congress. And brand new Congress and Justice Democrats, the leadership formally with brand new Congress went to Justice Democrats. They split the pack. Um, They endorsed us. Um, And honestly, you know, AOC was on the board. They offered very little support to the other candidates. And uh, they put everything into AOC. I felt like we were props just to get her elected. And um, it wasn't the integrity that we promised. Um, we, when we, we signed pledges, when we, you know, we first started with Brandon Congress, that we wouldn't even endorse against each other. And we signed those pledges to make pledges and made those promises. In 2020, AOC did endorse against the slate and actually Ro Khanna was on our slate and he, he endorsed um, some of the corporate candidates, of, as, you know, against some of our slate with um, with uh, Justice Democrats. But from my experience with all these federal PACs, I highly recommend if you do have a, a candidate of interest and you want to support their campaign, donate them to them directly. Because, you know, we were promised all these services. They wasn't fulfilled. Um, we, we paid them for that. But they raised money off of our campaigns. 
And you're very limited as a federal PAC on what you can do for a candidate, even advertising. And you're and they're only allowed federally with the FEC to give twenty eight hundred dollars. So when you see these federal PACs saying, "Oh, we need a million dollars," for example, for Paula Jean to joke, to, you know, to, to get rid of Joe Manchin, it's a fallacy. They, that money doesn't go directly into those campaigns. So um, that was my experience. So anybody out there, you know, I have joined the People's Party. Um, you know, give give to a new party. You know, the Democrats are so corrupt and give directly to a candidate. If you believe in a candidate and you want to support their campaign, of course, volunteer and invest in it. But if you're going to give your money, so many people across the country, millions of us work so hard to get these people elected. And a lot of people give up their lunch money. They don't pay their bills, uh, you know, because we had this so-called movement of ordinary people running for office. And don't give it to somebody that's not going to use the, that money for that purpose. And, you know, they're just trying to enhance their career. So basically, that's what a lot of these federal PACs are. Yeah, I donated money to Bernie Sanders sometimes when I really, I really didn't have it to like, mm -hmm. like, honestly, I really shouldn't have given him that money. <laughs> like, I look back on it and I'm just like, oh, my God. <laughs> but yeah, um, give up so much. And it's 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 disgusting mm -hmm. how how these, you know, these these campaigns are exploited and, and the money is not where people think it's going. Um, of course, it's support for candidates. The federal PACs are, but it's not the support like you can do. Like, you know, if you want to invest, invest directly into a campaign. Agreed. Now, I saw the documentary Knocking Down the House. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting to me, so I, I saw your story, AOC's story, Corey Bush and Amy's story. And what was interesting to me is that there was one part in the documentary when you were driving through a neighborhood and you were pointing to the houses. And I, I always remember this, like from anything from that documentary, I always remember this part. You were pointing to the houses and you were saying, you know, this person has cancer, that person has cancer. And that that just kind of like blew my mind for people who may not know. Why is it that way? Why did so many people in that area have cancer, in your opinion? Well, I do know it's 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 not an opinion. You know, the Industrial Revolution was built on the backs of West Virginians. I'm a proud coal miner's daughter and granddaughter. I think uh, my family dates back at least six six generations in coal. But the thing is, you know, politicians like Joe Manchin, Shelley Moore Capito, and even you know uh, our local politicians are beholden to industry. They cut back regulations. And, um, you know, mountaintop removal existed, which mechaniz mechanization took the jobs of men. Um, it created a lot of water pollution. When you they clean coal, it's like back in my grandpa's day, you know, they used to wash it with soap. Now they wash it with hundreds of chemicals and it, can, it creates a byproduct that they have to get rid of. So they get rid of it in different ways. We have these big earthen dams called slurry impalements, and they also inject it into abandoned coal mines underneath their communities, which is probably the case there in that neighborhood, which is where I raised my children in Leicester, West Virginia. A lot of people um, that live in coal communities, the industry doesn't give back. Um, I've buried a lot of my family members to coal. Um, I've lost a lot of people because we leave, you know, we lead in drug overdose death in, in the country here in West Virginia and suicide. Uh, you know, this is one of the most impoverished states in the nation. And in the coal regions in Appalachia, you would think after as much as we sacrificed that we would be rich. But we are, you know, we live in some of the most impoverished areas. And a lot of people in the Appalachian region, especially in the coal field regions, don't have something as basic as a clean glass of water. We've not even advanced to some people don't even have adequate sewage systems in our areas. So it, it's a big problem. And that's why I became an activist um, over 20 years ago. I found out about mountaintop removal. I, I never imagined in a million years, you know, I, I'm proud of my family for sacrificing so much and working in the coal mines, but I never dreamed that they would blow up mountains just for that seam of coal uh, on top of a mountain. You know, we here in West Virginia, you know, we're some of the most despicable people in the world. We're prideful and we have a deep, deep connection to the land and our community and each other. 
and for them to just blatantly destroy our communities like they have and not giving back to our communities. You know, most of our family members, most of us that are native West Virginia, you know, we've been here generation after generation after generation. We settled here before the coal industry did. And of course it put the food on the table for a lot of families. Um, it, it provided jobs, but now, you know, the market for coal has declined. It's on its way out. We don't hear enough about economic diversity in our state. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no outlook for job development. And, you know, we basically have been exploited for politicians and industry to get rich off our backs. And there's a clear difference between being a friend of a coal miner and a coal baron. And most politicians are friends to industry and they don't care about the workers here. And there's hardly any workers rights. And they pulled the backs out of the unions. It's, it's just, you know, this is the heart of labor. You know, Mother Jones, Joe Hill, the miners of Blair Mountain, they shed blood for the rights of coal miners. And it's disgusting. Even, even with the UMWA, Shelly Marcapito is anti-union. She wants to close their doors. In the 2020 primary, Richard Ojeda and I don't agree on a lot of things, but we were the two top pro-union pro candidates in the state. And even though Shelly Marcapito wants to close the doors of the UMWA, they endorse Shelly Marcapito in the primary. The, the political dynamic here in West Virginia is so corrupt. I've heard from one of my mentors, Charlotte Pritt. She was a delegate. She beat uh, Joe Manchin in a gubernatorial primary back in the '90s, and she said, "If you could, if you could, uh, if you could work in politics in West Virginia, you could do it all over the world because it's so corrupt here. You learn so many lessons." Even then, when she was, she became the gubernatorial nominee. Joe Manchin started a campaign, Democrats for Underwood, and he actually got the Democrat, uh, Democratic establishment to get behind her primary opponent instead of uh, standing up for her after she beat him in a primary. Oh, my gosh. Um, when I hear about like the environmental issues, this is something that I try to tell people like everyone brings up Flint about the water issue in Flint. It's not just Flint. It's 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 communities that are impoverished communities where people are living in low like income because like you would never see this happen in Beverly Hills. That's you just right. wouldn't like they target like those communities and it's a problem as if the people who live there are not as important as people who live in in wealthy areas in this country. It's it's a problem. Um I'm curious why do you feel that people in West Virginia continue to vote for Joe Manchin? Cuz it that just drives me crazy cuz I'm just like don't people see like how corrupt he is? Like he's one of the most wealthiest senators in, in DC right now. So I just don't understand. Like, why do they continue to vote for him? Well, the democratic establishment continues to give, give support. And one thing that I've seen a talk, you know, traveling around the state in 2018 and prior to COVID from the, the you know, the, the folks that I talked to on the ground is they're not motivated to vote for Democrats and the same people are voting for people like Joe, Joe Manchin. You know, people still have cardboard for windows. They don't have the jobs that they were promised. They don't have clean water and they don't have adequate sewage systems. And, and, you know, this is the Bible belt, but I swear to you, if Jesus would split the sky and say, I was a Democrat, um, you know, they would say fake news and, and turn their back because you know, Democrats have been in charge here for at least 40, 50 years, you know, a few decades, and they have done nothing. And even after we've seen this state go sweeping red, sorry about the dogs, even even though we've seen this state go sweeping red, um, it's because Democrats are not doing anything to reach voters. There's absolutely no change whatsoever. And people are just desperate. That's why they voted Republican, because they don't believe in Democrats anymore. And it's been proven that the majority of Americans don't believe in their government. And it's because the Democrats and Republicans, they're the same people. But a lot of times when you when you see these people like red states like now, like West Virginia, it's because people have suffered so much that they're just they're looking for anything to believe in. And a large part of it is propaganda. You know, even as a coal miner's daughter, I drank acid mine drainage when I was a little girl. I lived in a community called Iroquois up next to Mullins, which was my birthplace. And our, our water came out of an abandoned coal mine. It was it was orange and it had a blue and purple film. 
and it had specks of metal in it. I didn't know I wasn't a redhead until I was 12 years old and my stepdad got laid off in the coal mines and we had access to clean water for a while and he had to move to North Carolina for employment. It's it, People have been abused here, especially in the Appalachian region, so much and, and propaganda, you know, bidding against each other for basic human rights like clean water and jobs and just have, you know, just placating on their desperations to keep us divided. And a lot of people treat their vote like they do, you know, they like it's football. But the majority of, you know, at West Virginians, I know specifically looking at the data, you know, a lot of people have went independent. They don't believe in the system. And if you, you know, even with candidates like myself, it's hard to believe in, you know, in that candidate just because of that Democratic label, because people have not seen change. And now they're seeing now, even with Republican leadership, that it's not changing. People mm -hmm. are just waking up to the political dynamic and they're desperate. Do you feel that like oh, sometimes yeah. when people say, oops, I got an echo, sorry. Um, do you feel that sometimes like when people say, well, you know, how could people vote for Trump? Um, West Virginia, you know, went to Trump. What do you think it was about? Well, I, I know how I feel about Hillary Clinton, but what do you think it was about Hillary Clinton that really turned people off from her in West Virginia and, and pushed them towards Trump instead? Well, here's my opinion, because Bernie Sanders in the 26 in 2016, he won all 55 counties, for, you know, with the Democratic primary. And I think the appeal to Donald Trump was he wasn't a polished politician. You cannot speak to four people when you're elitist and your establishment. And, you know, that's why I run for office. I was desperate for change. I'm a mother and a grandmother. I was never in this for a political career, but ordinary people who better to serve us than us, right? You know, somebody like Hillary Clinton that's never worried about balancing the checkbook, never worried about food on your table or hungry or worried about, you know, the basic day-to-day -day things that we worry about across the country. It doesn't resonate. And I think that the reason why Donald Trump resonated and Bernie Sanders won all 55 counties in West Virginia, because it was different and they were relatable, even though, you know, some of the things that Donald Trump says is terrible. He, he He's not polished. He's not a lady well, elitist. You know, I went into a community called Rodale in Wyoming County and I was talking to a firefighter and actually came to find out we were probably kin to each other. And I was talking about economic development. And he says, ma'am, uh, if you don't mind, in order for me to understand you, then you're going to have to talk on my level, level and not use big words. You know, that's the thing in a lot of these poor communities. Education is a big issue as well. And somebody like Hillary Clinton is not relatable to ordinary people. I can see that. Um, workers Control of Production said the coal strikes of the 70s prove coal miners can fight back with their unions. Independent from capitalist parties, miners at Warrior Met Coal in Alabama are proving this in action. Uh, well said. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have to get your opinion on the squad because I, I, I have to say I am incredibly disappointed in the squad. I've been very vocal about that, especially since like I was one of those people that really believed in them. Like I believed like AOC, Cory Bush, like all of them were going to make a big difference. I, I believe what they said. And I was like, finally, someone that's going to go into DC and is going to fight for everyday working people. And over the past couple of years, I have just watched them just cave to establishment, whether it was force the vote, whether it was the fight for 15 and I just feel like now it seems like they've become more of like celebrities, especially like with AOC. And I want to get your opinion about that. Like, how do you feel about the squad? And looking back on things when all of you first started running, did you see that or did you think that this would, would happen with them? Um, well, you know, Medicare for all is a dirty word now, too. You know, I had my questions about AOC at first. I thought she was, you know, out of all the slate, honestly, and I'm going to be transparent, I don't know if I've told this before, but something in me was not, I, I didn't feel good when she got elected. I felt like, especially after what Justice Democrats did and putting all their eggs 
you know, one basket and that was AOC and turn on their back on the other candidates. It was hard for me to celebrate, but I wanted to see if she was going to do what she promised. And that was more important to me than how I felt about how we were treated. And um, I'm really disappointed, just like everybody else. You know, millions. I mean, I've been verbal about it. I've caught, caught a lot of scrutiny. But at, at the end of the day, what matters is we tell tell the truth. And the truth is we you know, we all as a unified slate made these promises and the, what, the reason why people like myself didn't get elected is because we were not going to bow down to the establishment once we got elected. And I was really surprised, especially with Cori Bush. Cori Bush, I love her with all my heart. She's been a good friend of mine. But the biggest disappointment is seeing her get there. It's just like Occupy Congress when she was protesting on the Capitol steps. That's a no protest zone. When we tried to do the same thing, we got arrested. Capitol Police specifically told us that she had to get permission from Congress to protest Congress. So it was smoke and mirrors. It was a lie. It was a lie for publicity. And I never was so heartbroken when I seen AOC and Cori Bush running up to Chuck Schumer and kissing his ass. I, you know, I expected these people to stand up for us. That's what that this whole movement was supposed to have been about is getting ordinary people elected. And even if you couldn't persuade in votes in Congress, at least they had, especially AOC, she has millions of Twitter followers. During the Medicare for all marches, she could have amplified that just by a simple tweet and she didn't. She's, it, it's, she calls it a political career now. She, she framed herself like she was just one of us. None of us even knew that she worked for the Kennedy campaign. Um, after she got elected, her mother, I seen an interview that said that she always had political amb ambition and she wanted to be president one day. Well, if that was the case, why was she campaigning with us? Because, you know, people are literally dying in this country. And we, millions of people didn't give up their lunch money and didn't pay their bills and spent hours upon hours phone banking, knocking on doors for AOC to go kiss Chuck Schumer's ass. And it's so disappointing. I have done this for so long and I still believe in a movement within us. We have seen across this country, even though we, we suffered these disappointments, that there is power in the people. And, you know, I've left the Democratic Party. I don't want to have anything to do, do with that. And especially after a big racist implosion with the Democratic Executive Committee here in West Virginia, because of COVID, it went public. No word from Joe Manchin, no word from, from you know, the national DNC about, you know, blatant public racism. And Democratic, the Democratic Party is supposed to be the party for the people, and they're not. They are funded by the same people, and that's corporations and lobbyists and special interest groups. That's who they take care of. The, you know, every, every bit of legislation that we see, it's always the corporate loopholes, and then we get our breadcrumbs. They dangle that little carrot in front of our nose. And I honestly believe the way we're going with the two-party system, that's why I joined the People's Party. After I've done this for so many years, I'm tired. And I want to, this, this one last thing, I want to fight for my grandson. Because people, I mean, I have been to more funerals than I have family reunions. I'm not in this movement because of notoriety. I mean, the hardest thing for me has actually been the name recognition. I have had mentors that, the, you know, they fought so hard for normalcy, for just a clean glass of water. I want to wake up and not worry if my grandson and my children will get cancer. That's the only reason I'm here. And uh, to see people that stood shoulder to shoulder with us and made all these promises, it's so disheartening. And it's 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 beyond disappointment. And they should be ashamed of themselves because people, like I said, they're dying and there's no excuse for not keeping their promises after everybody worked so hard to get them elected. Hmm. I saw uh, the Met event. I saw that AOC was at the Met Gala and I also saw there was a protest going on outside and it was really disturbing to me to see her parading around with this dress that says tax the rich as if this is supposed to be making some type of statement. But 
I felt like the AOC that I was introduced to in the beginning would have been outside on the street with the protesters and not inside at the, the gala with all the wealthy people. And it just seemed like she didn't even care. It, it Like even when she walked outside and they were taking pictures of her, I'm like, is this a Vogue cover or something like that? You are not a celebrity. You're supposed to be a politician. And I felt like I felt like she's kind of like taken in like that whole celebrity persona. And that seems like what it is now. And so now it's like, for me, when I see them say that they're fighting for things, it doesn't feel real to me. It just feels like theater. And I, I want to get your opinion about um, one thing that happened recently. There was the vote for the Iron Dome to fund the Iron Dome. And AOC voted present. And then she started crying and for me, it's just like, why Nancy Pelosi whispered something in her ear and she voted present and the start crying. I don't even know if the crying was real. And for me, it's just like, what is the point of being there? If you're supposed to, it was supposed to be a hostile takeover of the democratic party. That's not hostility. If you're just going to go along with what the democratic establishment wants you to do, what is the point? What is the point of going there and just voting present and not really fighting for anything? I think it is theater. I mean, just like the protest at, at the Capitol and them sleeping there, they had to get approval for Congress and it, it's nothing but political theater. And we have to quit treating politicians like celebrities. You know, they are public servants. Can you imagine getting interviewed for a job and going working for the company next door and saying, Hey, I still work, you know, I work for them, but you still pay me. You know, I still work for you. That doesn't work. You know what I mean? She she made a promise. She was supposed to be working for us. And now she's working for the establishment. She gave over $100,000 of grassroots money to people that she promised to fight. Um, I mean, the only opinion I have is it's disgusting and, and disappointing. And it is theater. It's just like when, you know, the picture of her where she's she's bent down with the kids in cages and she's crying. They were people there getting arrested. And I remember it was a photo op. It was fake. She wasn't crying. And, you know, that's, that's like I said, I was worried. And, and everything that I was worried about has come true. I wanted to celebrate, but there's nothing to celebrate anymore. There's nothing to celebrate at all about, you know, her being a celebrity. It's, she's supposed to be AOC, the public servant, and she was supposed to bust the halls of Congress wide open, her and Cori Bush, and make a statement that everybody in Congress was supposed to be public servants. And now they're just the same as the rest. Mm. Thank you so much for the super chat, The Traveler. The excuses defending her were complete BS. Yeah, I agree. I agree, The Traveler. Thank you so much. Um, Valerie said, hello, Sabby and Paula. Uh, can Paula Jean explain why MPP didn't just reform the Green Party, how this won't split third voting, making it less viable, and who they plan to run in 22 and 24? But I think that we need we need a new national party. Um, one that compete and have a populist message and re reach everybody. It's just like here in West Virginia. I believe in the Mountain Party and the Green Party. But you go, you know, it's it's propaganda. If you say green or climate change to some of these coal miners that don't know, it turns people off. And and what's different is we're getting ballot access across the country. You know, we are going to push to get into debates. And uh, you know, we I think that we need a new party and we need to reach people from all sides because I think there's good people on all sides. And, and and I think that people are looking for a new place to land. And, uh, you know, when we look at third parties, we need to look at the People's Party as a new national party. Um, I don't know about candidates running in 2022. Florida just now got ballot access. Um, we're still, you know, trying to work on getting ballot access in the other states. And um, I've heard talk of plans of running candidates, but I don't know if that, you know, if that's going to happen right now. Awesome. Um, another thing I was going to ask, like in reference to that. So one thing I noticed after the squad like got elected, it seemed like they stopped going on to independent media outlets that actually helped them get elected, that put the word out about them. If I remember correctly, I think AOC went on to Jimmy Dore's uh, show first. I think that was the first place I saw her. But then it was like after they won, 
they would run away from these same outlets. Like I saw them run away from them at the Capitol and other places as well. And except for maybe TYT, maybe they might go on there. But other than that, they don't, they're not going on independent platforms anymore. I don't know if they're just told to stay away from that and just focus on mainstream media or what. But how do you feel about some of the independent like platforms that are still making excuses for justice Democrats and still making excuses for the squad? Well, um, not to call people out, but like Kyle Kalinske and TYT, um, Jink was on the board uh, with which AD and um, you know, Kyle was at, at for, you know, there for the origination of that. And I think that, you know, they all worked in conjunction to get, you know, AOC elected and it never was about, you know, putting, the power into the hands of the people. It was about, you know, people lining their pocketbook and getting people elected. And I think that's why they still defend it. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate, especially, you know, um, independent media like you, Sabrina, that will actually tell the truth um, because it's just smoke and mirrors. You know, now I feel like oftentimes they're, they're, they're using um, their outlets to misinform voters. And I think that's an injustice. No, I, I, I agree as well. Cause I've told people here multiple times, like I'm tired of democratic party. I'm tired. I'm just tired of the two party system because this is the same thing every time. And I tell people to follow the money because like the, it all comes down to that. We were just talking about like the class structure on Friday and we showed everyone a picture of like, who is really where and our electoral, like politicians, like the Democrats, like Obama, all of them, they are not at the top. They are not at the top in this country. It's the CEOs, it's the corporations, it's the banks. It So I feel like a lot of people don't really understand that. Like they understand that Amazon, Jeff Bezos is corrupt. They understand that the Waltons that own like Walmart is corrupt. But I think a lot of people like, until I did that show on Friday, a lot of people contacted me and said, I didn't know about JP Morgan. I didn't know about. So it's important for people to, to know that there's other factors at play as well. And I also explained to people that the reason why they don't want to cancel student loan debt is because you have companies like Sally Mae, they donate to Republicans and to Democrats. So this is why nothing gets done. And, and that's, that's one thing I felt like Bernie continued to preach, but it just seems like now all of a sudden, like after Trump lost and Joe Biden won, now, all of a sudden, it seems like some people just don't remember that. Right. Right. And well, I think the complexity of, of, of understanding, you know, how corrupt it is with money and politics to understand the complexity of federal PACs, super PACs, um, and even a lot of our socialjustice.orgs, their political umbrellas to the party, and they funnel money in and they don't, you know, they don't even have to disclose oftentimes who those donors are and bundling. Um, out of Sil Silica Valley, um, I seen where they were bundling money, where rich folks were getting together and said they were husbands and, uh, you know, grandmothers, and they were putting all their money in one pot to, you know, to to, to hide and put that money into campaigns. It, it's just it's so complex. I think it's it's just hard for people to understand unless you have to deal with it, and I think that's why they get by with it. And that's another reason that the People's Party is important to me. It's because there is lack of accountability. And uh, the reason I joined is because of the promise, and I hope that everybody holds to it, um, which I do believe they will, is holding candidates accountable. If they go and get elected, then, uh, you know, if, if they've done like AOC and Cori Bush, they'll call them out on it. And, you know, the party is funded by the people. And we need we need ownership of our government and, and until we end citizens united united and get dark money out of politics and we or we find other ways like the people's party it's never going to change agreed thanks so much for the super chat ashura can you ask paula if mpp has addressed the racist comments said on a video call months ago and what has been done about that thanks so much ashura i'm not sure if you know about that or not paula I don't know about racist comments on a video chat, but I do know the board. Um, I really vetted when I come into this, you know, come into the party and um, I've seen how they've dealt with issues. 
and I've seen how they stand up to people and I know how they take action if there is problems. And, uh, you know, a lot of people may not see that internally, but I know it. And I think people know me well enough to know if things were not right, I'd probably be one of the first ones to say. But my, from my experience thus far since I've been with, you know, with the People's Party, I'm really, really proud of the hardworking individuals that are on the board. And as we move to a convention and we create our, you know, our national council, you know, it's putting the party into the people's hands. And, um, you know, people are deciding the bylaws, you know, it's a diverse group creating that structure. And uh, I'm really proud of the hard work that I see internally that's happening right now with the People's Party. And I can tell you that I see that they, if there is a problem, that they address issues immediately. Yeah, one thing I want to let people know is that when I was like volunteering for the Medicare for All March, uh, we had infiltrators, like some of you may have heard about this, and they were saying that there was this Nazi guy that we invited. We did not invite him. That never happened. But we did have people infiltrate, and they took basically took our graphics and put his picture on there to make it seem like he was invited. Even that guy himself said he was never invited. So that is always going to happen. Like when you have these groups, Bernie Sanders had infiltrators in his campaign. There's always going to be those people that pretend like they're on your side and they're with you. And then they're, they're actually there just for, for bad reasons. They're not there for good intentions. Yeah. You know, just like the Medicare for all marches. Um, and I've, I've been an organizer, like I said, over 20 years. And when you actually start bringing change and you make some noise, infiltrators always come in to cause problems. I'm not saying that's the case with the People's Party. I wasn't there for that. And I don't even know what the video that you're talking about, but um, it does happen. I agree with you, Sabrina. Um, you know, the Medicare for all, all marches was a prime example of that because I knew all the organizers there too. And it, it wasn't happening like they said it was. Thank you so much for the super chat, The Traveler. When AOC gaslit us about forced the vote for Medicare for all, that was the end of my support for her. Thank you so much for that, The Traveler. Yeah, there was something that came out about that during that Capitol protest. It was Max Blumenthal um, was asking Cori Bush about this. Why didn't you guys force the vote? And Cori Bush's response was, that's, and, and by the way, I don't know who the guy was with her. I don't know if that was like her bodyguard or whatever, but he stopped her from finishing what she was saying. But she said, that's Bernie Sanders in Pramila Jayapal's bill. And for me, I was just kind of like, so we're only going to fight for things that are bills that we wrote. I don't, I don't know. Like, I want to get your opinion on that. Well, that was one of our top platform planks. And that was one of our top promises. Um, when I was in DC and we were out at the Medicare for all March, Corey showed up. And at first I was really excited, but one of the organizers went to her and said, you know, why don't you sign um, on our platform with Medicare for all in the marches? And she refused. And that was, you know, the basic things that she promised. And one of the things that she said, because she's, you know, she said, well, the gatekeepers, I, I just found out that's why I showed up because she was friends with me and Zaina Day, the executive director of the People's Party, because Zaina used to work with Brandon Congress. And she said the gatekeepers didn't let, you know, she didn't know we were there. And she just found out because the gatekeepers didn't let her know. And my question is, who are the gatekeepers and why has, you know, it, Medicare for all, like I said, is a dirty word. And that's something that we promised. We promised to fight with health care. You know, Corey and I were surrogates for Bernie Sanders. We, you know, we sit on panels fighting for Medicare for all together. And now they're not going to fight, fight for it as elected officials. Why? Why? Even, you know, single payer health care needs to be pushed. And even if it's not Bernie's legislation, this is one of the richest countries in the world. It's been proven if we had single payer health care, it would save our country money. And it would, you know, and, and people, even like myself, I have so many health issues and I can, I can barely go to the doctor because I don't have insurance and people shouldn't have to live this way. And we promised, promised single payer health care. We traveled the country with Bernie Sanders Speaking on panels, like I said, why is Cori Bush not standing up in AOC for Medicare for all now? People should be asking that question. It was at one of our top platform panics. Mm. No, that's that's a good question. I think that 
I don't know if a lot of it is like pressure that they're getting from the establishment. Either way, it's not an excuse because they were they were supposed to go there and push back against the establishment. Like that was the whole point. They weren't supposed to go there and go along with them. And I just think of all those times that I donated, that I donated money to like AOC. I donated money to like Bernie Sanders. And then just to see them just go in there and just be like the, the regular establishment Democrats. Like I said this before, like I want my money back. And I, I just feel, I, I feel played. Like I really do. I feel like I look back on things and I'm like, why, why did I believe it? Why did I fall for it? I don't know. I want to get your opinion about the Joe, the Biden administration. I'm trying not to laugh because he's just a disaster right now. But what do you think about the Biden administration? Joe Biden right now, I believe has an approval rating. I, I think last time I checked, it's below 30 now. Uh, Kamala Harris is, is down in the twenties with approval rating. Do you think that Joe Biden is even going to run for president in 2024? And do you think Dems actually have a chance to even bounce back? I think that Democrats are handing the next election hand over fist to Republicans. And I don't think it matters to them because they're one party and they're and you know, their leaders are, you know, corporations, lobbyists and special interest groups. Um they're not fulfilling their promises. You know, the heroes, which I don't believe that we should be putting all of our stock in heroes. The heroes are us and the heroes is this movement and us fighting back together. But even the heroes are not fulfilling their promises. And it's it's going to happen just like here in West Virginia. If you can't be trusted, you know, people, you know, the one thing about politicians is we know they lie. And, you know, AOC and Cori Bush was supposed to be the people that we can believe in. And even with the Biden administration, you know, Republicans, even Donald Trump promised single payer health care. Democrats and Republicans promised that. And Democrats are going back on their promises. And I feel like that they're handing the election over to the Republicans. We already saw some of that with um, Virginia with the governor election in Virginia, Dems lost Virginia. I, I had a feeling that was going to happen. The governor race in New Jersey was also very close between the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate. And I honestly just feel like at this point, I try to like encourage people that we all need to come together on the class issue and not so much focus on left versus right, because I feel like that's just something that's put in place to divide us instead of us focusing on what Bernie was trying to tell us to do, the 99%, because most of us are not a part of that like top 1%. And I want to get your opinion about this. When you think about people in West Virginia, what if there was a candidate that was not partisan, wasn't a Democrat or Republican, and they ran solely on the class issue? How do you think that would work with people in West Virginia? Or do you think people in West Virginia would still most likely go for uh, the Republican? Well, from my experience, um, I had a lot of Republicans change their party affiliation to vote for me. And it was because, you know, the populist class message resonated. And I, you know, of course, I'm a West Virginia native, West Virginian coal miner's daughter, granddaughter. So, you know, that resonated. And I do believe that that can happen. Um, you know, Republicans and Democrats, Republicans are better at it, but they're not doing anything to reach the working class and poor. And I feel like that if if we could get that message out in communities and, and, and reach people where they are, I really do think, especially in red states, if we did have non-corrupt candidates, that were not affiliated with the two party system. I think that we, we would see a big change in this country. So you guys heard that. It's not just vote for it. Yep. Yep. You guys heard that. It's not just me. It's not just me. Uh, thank you so much, Kyle, for the super chat. Healthcare is how they keep you working crap jobs. What? Yeah, that's so true. Cause people will stay at their jobs that they don't like because they need the health insurance. And Blue Moon Red Wine said, Paula, would you support the student debt march on January 18th? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, that's another big problem that we have to deal with that we just can't. Mm. And that's a Biden promise that's not been fulfilled. Another one. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, what advice would you give someone who was maybe thinking about running a grassroots campaign, whether they were running third party or 
or any other uh, party affiliation? Um, I think that people need to look at the data and see if, you know, winning is not everything, but seeing that, you know, if the possibility of winning races, because I'm not, I'm not running for office again and taking grassroots money, knowing people that can sacrifice so much unless I have a viable chance. Um, I don't think it's right morally. And I, I don't want, you know, to, for people to, to give up for something that's not going to work. Um, also surround yourself with a lot of support. Um, believe it or not, you know, you talk about how you feel used. I do too. I, you know, I can't get the last four years of my life back and the sacrifices that my family's made, um, the threats, you know, people calling in the middle of the night saying they want to hang my grandson from a tree. Um, that happens running as a candidate. You have to have thick skin. You have to be able to deal with the scrutiny and make sure that you have a good support base and make sure that you have people that can help build a good campaign. And when I say that, I mean, even within the structure of building your teams and your needs, find a, somebody that has run a grassroots campaign and look to their mentorship and advice. And if somebody really, you know, if you're thinking about running for office, um, that's one of my responsibilities in with the People's Party as candidate engagement director, because I think it's vitally important to hear from somebody that's run for office and you can hear the positive and negative. Um, so if anybody's thinking about running for office, you know, always reach out to me because I, you know, I can talk about the details and give advice. Um, but the biggest thing is you have to have that thick skin and you have to have a good support base around you and your, if, you know, your family's in it too. So make sure that your family is okay with it and they have a good support base as well. I'm curious, I uh, got to get your opinion on this as well. In your opinion, why do you feel that Nina Turner lost her election? Well, I don't know. I was kind of disappointed that Nina was, was Senator Turner was not talking about Medicare for all. And, you know, the day the Medicare for all marches were happening, even after the disappointment with AOC, you know, AOC was out canvassing with Senator Turner. And I think in part um, her aligning with people that uh, people don't believe in, I think maybe that's a part of it is, you know, even though she knows that AOC was not doing like she was supposed to, and she'd already been proven that already, you know, she'd already proven that she was aligning with the corrupt establishment and then, you know, them being out with her and pulling back on Medicare for all. I think I've seen an interview you know, where she said that we wouldn't be perfect and it perfect. I don't know her exact words and we'd suffer disappointments. But, you know, she is still basically aligning with the squad. And, you know, out of the love for Corey, 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 you know, she's always been good to me. It's always been a pleasure to travel, uh, you know, around the country with her. And I know that, you know, Senator Turner loves Corey. But, you know, right is right and wrong is wrong. And I think that most people in this country want somebody that's going to tell their truth. This is not about making friendships when you're a public servant. You know, you you make a promise to the people that you're going to serve them. And it's not about friendships anymore. The, the sole purpose of your job is to make sure that people's basic needs are met and you fulfill your promises, even if that means sacrificing friendships. Hmm. Thanks so much for the super chat, Steve. Steve said, Bernie, AOC, and Nina Turner failed to support the Medicare for all marches, even staying silent. So disappointing. Thank you so much for that super chat, Steve. Yeah, um, I agree. I, why Why do you think they were silent about that? Because my whole thing is, is like, I'm not saying you had to come out and support and march with us. I know they're very busy people, but they didn't even like tweet about it. Why do you think that is? I think probably in part because I've been around a lot of political operatives, too. And I think that's probably maybe somebody on their campaign team telling them to pull back. I don't know. I don't know what kind of bad advice they were getting behind the scenes. Um, you know, as a candidate, you know, we're just talking about advice. When you do run for office, you have a lot of people plugging your ears and you don't have to give up your morals for strategy. And if that's the case, you shouldn't be running for office. Um, like I said, you're there to be a public servant. I can't I can't say I can only guess that probably somebody was telling them that they should pull back on it. And and if they did, they were wrong. So uh, Shama Sawant actually just won her recall. 
And I want to get your opinion about that because I know it's uh, local politics, but I always tell people too, like not to forget about local politics, that those are just important positions as well. Um, she ran as a socialist and she won. And I'm curious to, to get to know from you, do you think that socialists can win in other states in this country? Yeah, I do. You know, I think that we need to get away from labels. I mean, progressive, it's been co-opted so much that we don't even know what that means anymore. You know, if you say socialism in red areas, it, it's off-putting to some people. And I think that we need to hone in on the message of policy and, and meeting people's needs as a, you know, as instead of labels. And I do believe that ordinary people can win races across the country. I've seen a lot of local seats where people have won those races and they're doing a lot of good for their community and within their states. And I think it's important. I think local races are in part more important than federal races because those folks internally can do do more for their community and their states than, um, you know, federal races. So uh, but I do believe that ordinary people can get elected. And that's the good thing about this movement is we've seen a lot of local candidates that had good hearts and good intent. And is you know, just one of, you know, they're part of us that are getting elected. And that's 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 a positive that we see right now out of all the federal disappointments. I know you mentioned Richard Ojeda. Um, what was interesting to me is that he was actually the first person I saw announced that he was running for president. And I mentioned that to people and most people I mentioned it to did not know. And I was like, yeah, he was on MSNBC and he announced he was running for president. And he said that he wanted to get rid of lobbyists or he, no, he wanted to put cameras on lobbyists. And then I saw MSNBC the next time around, they were announcing the presidential candidates and they left him off. And they also did that to Andrew Yang. They did it to him like twice where they just left people off. And I want to get your opinion on that. Do you think that was really like an accident or do you feel like it was on purpose? I think they do that. I think they treated Marianne Williamson bad too. It's even like, you know, in 2018 and 2020, I was the Democratic nominee. The party didn't even support a debate with my opponent. And my opponent refused to debate me and Joe Manchin did. And I think that the establishment, they're very strategic when it comes to giving people airtime. Anybody that they want to push back against, they're going to make sure that they forget to say their name. They make sure that they don't get that media interview. Um, and it's strategic because they, you know, name recognition is one of the things that help you, you know, that helps people win campaigns and they're going to do everything they can to silo folks that are actually going to bring change. Thank you so much, Ronnie, for the tip on Rockfin. I love your vital voice, Sabby, and the strength I've seen from Paula for a long time. I trust you both more than some other people that are streaming right now. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ronnie. That's really sweet. Um, I'm curious, do you think that there will be another progressive candidate like Bernie Sanders to to run in 2024? I don't know. I'm hoping that we get established enough with the People's Party that we can vet and we can find a candidate. Um, but I, you know, no fault to anybody that still thinks that they can, you know, they can run as a Democrat I personally can say that I'll, I'll probably never get behind a Democrat again just because of all the disappointments that we've experienced. And I, I do want to say this. It's not my fault, but, you know, millions of people along with me supported Corey and Alex. And I offer my apologies um, for everybody that believed what I said. I believed what I said at the time, but, you know, First and foremost, there should be accountability. And I've said it before and I say it again. I apologize to everyone that listened to me when I said that they should put their support behind them. I didn't expect the disappointments. I was kind of worried about AOC, but that was just my gut. I had no proof until things started going disarray with, the, you know, Justice Democrats. But to everybody that uh, supported, you know, supported them because of me, I offer my sincerest apologies. Oh, Paula, is it is is not I, I don't feel like you should have to apologize for real. I really don't. I think they I just I, I feel like the media I they I feel like they told the narrative that they knew a lot of us like would believe and they said the things that we wanted to hear and it just 
it was it was people who were running and they weren't taking like corporate money and they were saying things we wanted to hear. So for a lot of us, we're just like, well, yeah, like, why would we not like want to support them and not want to like vote for them? I'm curious, like, what advice would you give to people? You know, a lot of people went out and canvassed for AOC and Bernie. And I've talked to a lot of those people who are just like, now they're like, I'm never doing, I, I don't want to do it again. I don't want to do that for another candidate again. But they could do that for like third party candidate. What advice would you give to them for the people who may feel kind of, kind of bummed and feel like they, they've kind of lost hope? Um, I felt that way myself. Uh, and I, I totally understand it. Um, I'm one of those people, you know, if I get knocked down, I get, you know, I, I pick myself back up and, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the people's party, I don't know where I'd be right now, but I would probably put in a lot of my effort on, you know, into local candidates too. Um, it is disappointing, but if we just give up, um, then, you know, what do we have left? You know, future generations are also depending on what we do. And we have really, really shown the power that we have, even though, you know, it was so hard and it was so disappointing. Look what we look at what we've done, y'all. We made history and we can continue to make history. Um, it's just we you know, we're, it's I think we should still be in this fight. I just think that we need to re-strategize and fight in a different way. There is power in numbers. And I still believe and I'm humbled by the unity that I see across the country and I haven't give up on us. I know that uh, we, you know, we can bring change in this country and we've proven that we have, and I don't think that we should give up now. Someone was asking earlier, um, I lost the chat, but it, this, this was a good question. They were asking if you feel there's another way that people can fight um, without electoral politics, like ways that we can uh, fight back as a movement as well? I think, you know, with our power, you know, we need to be out on the streets. We need to be still holding protests. We need to be in representatives' offices, letting them know that if they don't do their job, that we're going to be in their face. Um, because there is power in numbers. And as an activist, that's where I got my start. And I know that the public can have an influence on politicians' decisions. And, uh, you know, a lot of politicians don't like scrutiny. And um, I think that we still need to be, you know, unified and we need to be out on the streets working together. You know, even if it's not electoral, you know, politics, I think every piece of the, you know, the puzzle, electoral politics in conjunction with protest and holding their, you know, our incumbents accountable, um, we still have a movement. And I think it's going to start with us having to get out on the streets. I agree. Um I got to get your opinion about Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this, but they have been uh, followed by protesters a couple of times. Like one time Joe Manchin was on his yacht and protesters uh, went up to his yacht. And it was really, um, really interesting because he was literally he was literally talking down on them because he's standing on this yacht and they're in the water. And then I saw Kirsten Cinema like run into the bathroom away from protesters who actually canvassed for her. Uh, how do you feel about those two and the so-called control that they have over the Democratic Party? Do you feel it's really them that's doing it per se, or do you feel like it's going to happen regardless if it was uh, Joe Manchin or Kirsten Cinema? I think that uh, it's rotating villains. You know, we've been protesting Joe Manchin for years. I mean, we all know he sucks. We know that his top donors are, you know, the pharmaceutical industry you know, the fossil fuel industry and um, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so he, he's, he's not any different. I think that I think it, I think it's to keep us distracted because there's just as many corrupt members in Congress, just as corrupt as Joe Manchin. And we see it all the time. You know, every every um, election season or if something's going on, if they want to keep us distracted, they find somebody to blame. Now, you know, of course, Joe Manchin and Kristen, show, you know, they're responsible for their actions. But Joe Manchin's just doing what he's always done. He's a corporate servant. He's not a people servant. And, you know, the majority of Congress is the same way. And uh, they're just looking for a scapegoat. So we will not look at, at the other bad, poor decisions that other members of Congress are making. Well said. 
All right. I want to give a big shout out to, oh, where did he go? Big shout out to James Sparks. Thank you so much for the tips on uh, Rockfin. And I do want to go ahead and shout out the Traveler. Thank you so much for the super chat. Biden endorsed Cinema in 2018 too. Yeah, it's interesting. Kirsten Cinema used to be Green Party and she supported $15 minimum wage. So it's interesting how people turn. I think some of these people are worse than Joe Manchin. Because Joe Manchin's never supported Medicare for all or a living wage. I think it's worse for people to make these, you know, these grandiose promises and go against their promises. I mean, that's one thing about Joe Manchin. You know, he he's been back and forth about women's rights and he's been a typical politician. But, you know, the AOCs of the world, they were supposed to be different than the Joe Manchins of the world. That was what's supposed to have been different. At least, you know, the majority time. Joe Manchin is honest about being corrupt and he's not lying, lying to people to get their votes. People vote for Joe Manchin anyway. You know, he's he, he's the here in West Virginia. His first cousin's the chair of the party. Prior to that, Larry Puccio is his best friends that's been around with him since he was a delegate. And he owns the Democratic Party here. And, you know, he has his set of worshipers that don't reach non-voters. Um, so, you know, it's expected. What's worse is people that have taken people's dollars that are suffering. At least Joe Manchin is, you know, he's, he's taken that corporate and lobbyist money and he's not placating to people and then, and, and them doing without food and then, and lying to them and then, you know, being different after they get elected. I think they're worse. Mm. Joy said, I'd rather get stabbed in the heart than in the back. There you go. All right, Paula, before we head out, can you tell everybody where they can find you? Um, you can find me at still Paula Jean 2020 on Twitter, Paula Jean Swearingen on Facebook. Um, and if you want to find out more about the People's Party, you can go to thepeoplesparty.org. Um, but thank you so much, Sabrina, if you ever need anything from me. Um, it, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. All right, guys, you know how we do this. Have a good night. Keep up the fight.